All right, I think we're going to get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Brendan Cohen um, from the Stanford Technology Law Review. Um, I want to just say a couple of very brief things uh, this morning before we begin. Uh, first, thank you very much to the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, um, especially uh, Professor Barbara Van Trevick, Ryan Kahlo, Tony Salzone, uh, Julie Aaron, and Elena Dolfo for all their help in uh, helping me choose the topics for this, this panel uh, and for helping narrow those a bit um, and helping find speakers. So we would not have been able to do this event without their, without their help and support. So thank you. Um, and additionally, I just want to make a quick announcement that uh, this year is the 15th anniversary of Stellar. And so we are having a reception tonight from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, just across the courtyard in the new uh, Newcomb building in the faculty lounge there. You are all welcome to come. And it is made possible thanks to the generous support of the Palo Alto offices of Baker and McKenzie and Morris and Forrester. So we are very grateful for them for that as well. So I'm going to turn this over to Julie Aarons for a brief introduction and then we will begin. So thank you. for putting together this, uh, this great conference today. And my name is Julie Ahrens. I'm the Associate Director of the Fair Use Project here at Stanford Center for Internet Society. We're excited to be your host, and again, thank you for coming. And we are really thrilled and thankful to have so many outstanding panelists here today. Uh, we have leading First Amendment privacy scholars, attorneys in private practice, representatives from entertainment industry and from internet companies, from public interest lawyers, as well as journalists. So, and they're all here today to uh, share their diverse perspectives, wisdom, and experiences on questions that really are at the forefront of lawmaking and policy debates today. That is, how are we going to grapple with the challenges and opportunities for free speech in this digital age quickly changing technologies and capabilities. We will explore these issues in three panels today. The first panel discussing the challenges of privacy rights and free speech. The second, exploring First Amendment architecture and its role in ensuring spaces for speech, both digital and um, physical spaces. And finally, a panel on free speech and copyright, specifically looking at the SOFA and Protect IP debates that are obviously so timely. So we welcome your participation, and we look forward to the many conversations uh, we are sure that today's conference will spark. So thank you all for coming, and so let's begin. James. Thanks, and thank you all for attending today. I'm James Temple. I'm a technology columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. I think we have a fascinating and topical theme to kick off the symposium this morning, uh, taking forgetting seriously or the right to be forgotten online. And of course, the European Commission just late last month came out with its long-awaited privacy proposals, which included a right for people to demand that their data uh, can be deleted online, as well as some pretty hefty fines for companies that fail to follow the code. Um, I think some we've seen some privacy advocates in the U.S. advocates in the U.S. call for similar rules, but there, there's nothing like the same kind of momentum behind such rules here, in large part because of the far different perspective here on, on where the balance should be struck between free speech and, and privacy rights. Um, in some ways, we've had these kind of incompatible legal frameworks for a lot that have coexisted and diverged for a long time until the internet came along and kind of threw a bit of wrench into it all. Um, so. The, the panel this morning inc includes uh, Franz Weira, a, a law professor at Georgetown University, who wrote the 2009 paper, The Right to Inform versus the Right to Be Forgotten, a Transatlantic Clash. Uh, Lothar, uh, Lothar Determan, a principal with Baker and McKinsey in San Francisco, focused on intellectual property and, I'm sorry, intellectual property and international law, and important for our purposes today. He's uh, certified to practice law in both Germany and California. Um, we have Patrick Ryan, who's policy counsel focused on open internet for Google. Uh, Michael Furtick, the CEO of Reputation.com, which helps people get their uh, online profile in order, you know, without a right to delete. Um, he's also a graduate of Harvard Law School. Um, one, one of these things is not like the other. I seem to be the only one without a law degree. 
Um, but I'll do my best to ask the right questions to keep this going along, which is really all we journalists do for those anyways. Um, so to start off the discussion today, we've asked uh, Franz to give us a few minute overview of the European perspective on the right to be forgotten in the sort of historical context uh, that got us to the point of those the rules being proposed late last month. So yeah, please take it away. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, to participate in this uh, very promising uh, symposium. As James just mentioned, I will try to sort of uh, put this right of, to be forgotten in perspective. Indeed, uh, last month, as you know, the EU proposed to reinforce data protection and in particular to provide internet users with a couple of strong rights that would entitle them to gain more control over what happens uh, with their data. And at the core of the proposal, it seems like indeed we have a right to be forgotten that is now mentioned in the proposal, a right to delete under certain circumstances information that is uh, uh, on the web. And also, as I see it, a uh, 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 reinforced right for consumers to control, to know what data uh, people out there have, uh, merchants in particular. Um, now, this bundle of rights is generally called the right to be forgotten, and I guess uh, one should uh, perhaps clarify a little bit what we mean when we talk about a right to be forgotten. Uh, there are many forms in which this right can be, um, can be given. Um, overall, I think in part it blends or it merges with a very common understanding of a right uh, that's always been engraved in privacy law in Europe. There are stories about me that belong to the past and that entitle me to have removed from public sources. There is a, an entitlement uh, rooted in a certain conception of private life that entitles me, former crook, to no longer be uh, considered or to be talked about. Uh, so. What I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that, in a way, this right to be forgotten that has acquired much publicity because of this new proposal uh, on the European level is something that's very old and very common and very rooted in the understanding that we have of what privacy uh, means. Perhaps a few preliminary remarks. Uh, I often hear people say, well, this is so vague. How can you enforce such a thing? I would want to stress the fact that the proposal just made by the EU is a project of a directive. It's not applicable law, law. It's law that will compel the member states to implement the directive and to adopt the rules that they see fit. So let's not look for something there is not in this proposal. These are not rules that are supposed to be directly applicable. So if we wonder about precision or enforcement, that may come later on. It's not necessarily to be found at the present stage. Uh, the second thing I want to, or that I run into, of course, is the question of enforcement. How can you enforce? How can you uh, transform the content of the internet, once the story is out there, how do you make it possible to have it deleted, to have it uh, removed? How will you avoid that Google will keep on producing information that is no longer relevant? Well, I'm not a technique, a techni no clue about what can be done. I just want to believe that it shouldn't just be a question of money. I think that we should uh, try to do our best to match 
our representations of what privacy is about, regardless of the technology that is uh, being used. I'm struck by the fact that we may, we are able to make Google make things appear at a certain level of information. In other words, not in the top pages, but at the end. One can even pay for that to be done. I think one could think of creative ways in which one could say, look, this is no longer relevant. This needs to be taken away. Might cost money, but I think that uh, uh, spending might be um, might be uh, actually uh, meeting the expectation of certain people whose concept of privacy is uh, is different from what it is here. Um, I guess one thing that is very important to to grasp and then to debate is the fact that the Europeans do not just believe in free speech. They have also promoted the idea that private life, one's intimate life, is constitutionally protected. And so there is no such thing as a free speech that would unilaterally make all other entitlements subordinate. The European Court of Human Rights regularly engages in balancing out the interest of society to be informed against the interest that an individual might have to be left alone, to be respected in his or her private life. And maybe one more thing, this entitlement is not only directed against the state. It's not just that the state could abuse its position and do things to you that would invade your private life. This constitutional entitlement also means that private actors may be restricted in their ability to intrude and to interfere uh, with your life. So, back to the right to be forgotten, uh, there's an abundant number of cases in which courts have engaged to decide whether an individual in, a, in certain circumstances would deserve a right to be forgotten, to be left alone. And I guess one of the objections I often hear is how can a judge do that? How can a, a decision be made about you know, when a person deserves to be left alone and when a person does not deserve to be left alone because his or her story is still interesting? I think there are ways that we could trust the judges to do that job, to do that balancing job. We trust judges to tell us what negligence is. We should be able to trust them to draw the line where public interest deserves information and where it no longer uh, deserves information. Let me give you a little story that happened not very long ago in Switzerland. A former uh, member of a, of a gang uh, was, uh, had gone to jail 20 years ago, 25 years ago, was a very heavy duty gangster, did lots of it, bad things, including robbing banks, which in Switzerland is not a good idea. <laughs> he finished, he spent at least 15 to 20 years in jail, where he learned to become a computer uh, analyst comes out of jail, gets hired by an American firm, makes a solid income, is respected by his peers, finds a life, is married to the woman who actually helped him get a job in the firm. And one day, one of his former crook colleagues is caught in do into doing uh, criminal activity again. At which point, a journalist finds nothing better than to go after the story and not only tell us what is happening today, but of course give the full list of the full names of all the former members of the gang. The guy got completely uh, destroyed. I mean, he makes a nervous breakdown. His entire effort to be rehabilitated is wasted. He loses his job and finds him uh, without employment. 
I have to, my, my thesis is that I do not see the point of making this story public. Maybe it's interesting to know that this former guy is now rehabilitated and leads a, 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 a law-abiding life, but there's no interest in publishing his name. There is no interest for the public to be able to trace where the guy comes from. Anyhow, I'm going to leave it at that for the right to be forgotten. I would just want to add um, one thing that is that seems to me very important. When I entrust, when I give information to my bank because they want to know if they can give me a loan, I do not expect my bank to go about and use the information and sell it to other merchants. That's what the directive is going to try to control, and I think to me, as a European, it seems like a fundamental entitlement. I am happy to get naked and show Amazon what I buy. And they can tell me, hi, France. Are you France? Oh, well, if you are, we have a couple of recommendations, which freaks me out, but I can live with that. I cannot live with the idea that I do not know to whom Amazon is selling my information and my taste and my way of life. At least, if that's the way commerce is supposed to function, then I do want to know and I want to be able to get after Amazon and tell them, look, now you give me back, or you tell me to whom you have talked. This is in the way of introducing uh, the new proposal. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and now we're going to ask both our give us, provide a bit of a counterpoint um, for, for the U.S. perspective, kind of laying out the legal framework and, and how we got to uh, some different points here. Okay, thank you very much, James. I'm very honored that I get to represent the U.S. perspective. As a recent immigrant from Germany, I used to get invited to these kinds of things to defend the European perspective. But since we chose a Swiss scholar to represent the EU here, even though <laughs> Switzerland hasn't joined yet for the business of bank secrecy and tax planning, um, I think it's just fair that I get to say what the U.S. thinks about this proposal. <laughs> and I'm glad that I get to represent to the U.S. because what a pathetic right this right to be forgotten. Here, out west, we fight for a right to be remembered. We want our 15 minutes of fame. We come up with new technologies. We create new data, social networking. We're running at fast pace, and all Europe can think of is to be forgotten. And I think one point Professor Vera made is that it's a very old right, and I think that's the one thing Europe can still claim for them, but it's something that the um, US, I think, has way overtake. I think the European position on data protection in general is not so much based on privacy, but on the idea that the automated processing of data is inherently dangerous activity and need to be regulated. And that's what was done in Europe. It started in my home state of Hessen in um, more than 40 years now. And it has created a regime that requires the minimization of the automated processing of data. The original reason for that was a fear that George Orwell's vision could become true of the glass citizen that is controlled by the government or by large corporations. And of course, here in the United States, we know that that would never happen to us. Nobody would spy on us. The government wouldn't do such a thing. And therefore, we did not follow this approach. We looked at this too in 1974. There was a bill in front of Congress that reads just like the European directive. And we decided against it at the time. We said um, it's not clear in 1974 that this is going to be so dangerous, and we decided that it's more important for free enterprise and free speech that we will not follow this regulatory approach. Instead of having this omnibus requirement of data minimization, we will have specific sectoral laws that fight particular evils. One reason, free enterprise. The other one, free speech. Professor Vero gave an example here of this crook who was rehabilitated, and then he was uncovered and, and um, 
had his name in the press. Our answer in the United States to that would be it's great that that was reported. It might have, for this individual, cost some pains, but in the end, the public saw his personal development. The public can discuss whether it is fair to let him escape his past or not, and that's a good thing that will lead to an increasing um, amount of opinions and information in the marketplace and people can form their opinion. If we always keep it secret that people can actually get out of prison and be better people, we'll never have an informed discussion about prison reform and sentencing and so on. Uh, the death penalty may prevail in this country if we don't talk about these things and, and put it on the table that people can actually be reformed. So that would be our answer. We would say more information is good. Information is the answer to bad information. And um, the free marketplace of ideas will will lead to um, the same and better results, actually, than to just keep things secret after a while. Now, what have we done? We've passed a bunch of federal laws. There's HIPAA on health information. There's GLB on financial service information that covers a little bit what you just mentioned, the fear that banks will share um, information. Um, there's also the Fair Credit Reporting Act that deals with the credit reports that can influence a person's life here. We have rules on a state level that you cannot base employment hiring decisions on credit reports anymore in some places and so on. So we are also addressing particular evils that are coming out. And we have a very fragmented um, privacy law now here in the United States, much more so than in Europe. In Europe, there is this one uh, directive that is implemented with some changes in, in the EU. And by the way, the, the new proposal is a regulation. It would be directly um, applicable to the members of the right out here. But the, the European law is not as fragmented as a result. Um, and Switzerland, even though it's not part of Europe, it has mostly um, kept up with the, with the rules, too, in order to be able to do business with the neighboring states for a primary reason. Now, what have we done on that particular example that uh, Professor Burr mentioned uh, in terms of sharing of information between Amazon and others? Here in California, we have a law, it's called the California Shine the Light Law, and it requires companies to disclose if they share marketing information with others. And you will see on websites of those companies are compliant with this, that they'll have a little section that says, your California privacy rights. And if you click on it, they will disclose to you who they shared with in the last year. Not everybody is compliant with this. A bunch of class actions um, are pending right now, but that is one example. And I can't list all the laws here. I just want to make the point that we do address abuse and problems in this country as well. But we don't do it with this regulatory approach where the basic line is it's all prohibited unless you have some specific permission. What we have in addition is private privacy torts. They're, they're as old as Europe, and they come from parts of Europe, um, namely the UK. And um, some of these um, have developed um, or been enforced by, by an article that was written um, about, um, well, a lot, of, a lot of years ago as well. And it has a number of things in there, intrusion upon seclusion, public disclosure of private facts, and so on, that would technically also read on this uh, right to be forgotten. And there's been cases where somebody um, had disclosure of private facts made that um, at the time seemed appropriate because the person was one of public interest. And then 20 years later, they were dragged in the press again with some um, facts. And uh, the courts have also in this country decided that under such uh, extreme circumstances, it's possible that somebody who had their private life dragged in the public eye when, when they were really a public figure can, after 20, 30 years, perhaps not um, can withdraw and make a decision and not have their private life dragged out. But it's, it, the way we're protecting it here, again, is just to, to protect against extreme cases of abuse and the um, balancing of um, public interest in information, free speech, often comes out at allowing the disclosures. And in any event, there has to be a reasonable expectation of privacy to start with. So if somebody has posted something on Facebook or posted something on Google or a friend of them posted something, and this is out there, then the reasonable expectation of privacy usually doesn't exist anymore, and it will stay in the public, and it will probably not with any of these torts that we have here ever be withdrawn. Um, these torts would work towards not having new information perhaps disclosed again if somebody is not a figure of public interest anymore. But there's certainly a difference in how that would be treated. In addition to that, we have relatively strict consumer protection laws. 
Um, it's sometimes when I moved here to the US 15 years ago, it appeared to me there wasn't as much. I thought also that the European uh, misconception, I think, that there isn't that much consumer protection law here. There is, uh, in the area of advertising and so on, um, the law is less paternalistic and expects people to, to understand that certain statements are more fluff than real information and so on. So there's less censorship here. Um, but there is consumer protection law, and the FTC has um, already 10 years ago come out and said that every company that collects information on the internet that they have to have a privacy statement, a disclosure, and so on. And they're very actively enforced if companies were saying something in their privacy statement and did not announce. But with our principles of free enterprise and free speech, if a company goes out there and says, I will take your information and I will disclose it to everybody else, then they can do that as a general baseline matter with um, some exception. Now, where does that lead us on the comparison to this right, of, uh, right to be forgotten with Europe? I think it would be, from, from the US perspective, it would be very alien to our concepts. I think we would uh, think it is far overreaching. We would also think that the various uh, European attempts in, in recent uh, times to basically go against Web 2.0, German privacy um, offices, uh, representatives of the government have publicly said Web 2.0 is basically illegal under German law. And um, there's an onslaught against any advertising finance business models with the cookies regulation. And this right to be forgotten is in that same theme, basically opposing uh, the new services, the internet economy, and basically trying to regulate it with immense um, upcoming costs for uh, the providers. What would that mean? Somebody will have to pay for it, and if, if the Europeans think that it can't be paid for with advertising, and it cannot be, um, and, and there will be additional regulatory burdens by imposing this regime, then somebody will have to pay for it. They will have to be paid for services. Maybe these paid for services will develop in Europe and will be very successful, and then we will be able to benefit from them as well in the United States. But I think in the meantime, the, the answer to the, the right to be forgotten from the US would be uh, clearly a uh, no thank you. And we would uh, probably think that in balancing the interest of free information and free speech and so on, we need to uphold our position very strongly and defend it against the regulatory approach that appears in Europe. My personal view is on some of these examples, and Eric Schmidt has um, said this, um, publicly said, you know, with all this information about people on, on the internet, when our children are 30, they'll have to change their names. I'd say, I have kids that are seven or nine and they're just getting interest in the internet. My hope is when they're 30, there's so much dirt on everyone on the internet <laughs> that we stop being so hypocritical and that the information wins in the free marketplace of ideas and that they don't have to worry about this anymore because in all their peers, there's the same kind of nonsense out there. And I think that summarizes the U.S. Not position. All of them. The ones that, that are my customers. That, that summarizes the U.S. position according to Louis Trump. Thank you for that. And and with that, with, with those helpful overviews, we're going to answer to kick off the, the panel proper now. Uh, Patrick, uh, as the Google guy on stage, can you you have sort of the privilege of being on the industry perspective? Okay. That's great. Thank you. I think I just have a couple slides to show. I don't know if you can travel to the deck. Hopefully, we'll do that with us. So while you're turning that on, let me just uh, go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Patrick Lai, and I'm Policy Counsel Open Internet at Google. I've been with Google for about a year. Um, and I, uh, for the past several years, have uh, split my time in academia at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and uh, in, in private practice. Before joining Google, I spent uh, I spent most of my time in the telecommunications industry doing government relations work. Um, my area of expertise at Google is very is very general in terms of policy issues, defending the open internet on a broad array of topics. I am not a privacy specialist. We have a team of people who deal specifically in privacy. Um, and so if we really get into very detailed sort of issues around privacy, that's just not my area of expertise. Um, and I do need to give a, of course, a disclaimer. As a large publicly traded company, there are a number of things that I'm unable to talk about for the leaking statements. Uh, and there's also, uh, as you might imagine, a number of cases and controversies and litigation that Google's involved in. And I'm unable to discuss those topics. So 
So having said that, let me let me just dive in. This is a um, I'm still a commuter from from Denver. Um, and I work in Mountain View during the week, but I go home to my family uh, on the weekends. And so technology isn't just important to me because of my paycheck. It's also very important to me for my communications with my children and for keeping in touch with with my family while I'm gone and to keep the distances as close as possible. Um, this picture here on the on the screen is of my two little girls, Carolyn is seven and Gabby is is four. Um, and I just love this picture because it, it's you know, out in front of our home in Denver and it shows really their personalities. Gabby's, you know, really just a fast charger and being carried back there, you know, very disappointed, but you know, she's she's a, she's always been a thinker. Um, so how does this relate to the right to be forgotten? My um, uh, I had a really interesting experience uh, over the course of Christmas break uh, when I came downstairs and we had a little area in our house where there's, you know, if you have mail, it goes into sort of an inbox. And if you have something you want to send, it goes into an outbox. And there was a letter in the outbox from my daughter, Carolyn. Um, and it had a pre-printed uh, return address from her and it was a letter sent off to a bank. And I, and I looked at it and it was sealed and I said, oh my God, what is going on here? And I had this this sort of you know dilemma where I said, oh my, you know, should I really open her mail? Right? And then I quickly got over that when I realized that she was sending off a credit card application. And, it was, uh, and so, I, so, I, so I wrote so I, so I, so I of course opened it up and, and um, you know to my surprise this is a picture of the of the of, of what was inside. You can see you know seven year olds do. She didn't just fold. She folded it into these nice little extra folds and put it in put it in there. And this is what was on it. It says, I am seven years old, please don't send me a card. <laughs> and so I talked to her about it because I'm fascinated with you know the fact that she you know had the insight to do this. And it, it all comes back to I'm getting a little off track here, but it comes back to the postcard I sent her was the first thing she received in the mail. So she has been checking her mail for the past, you know, three months, expecting people to send her things. I don't know who would send her things, but it turns out people do send her things. And I you know, just throw them away, but she would intercept them and read them. And she said, yeah, Daddy, this, the, the credit card company has been sending me uh, applications for a credit card. It's kind of annoying, really. <laughs> and so this is, this is what she said. And so I, of course, thought this was brilliant, and I refolded it up, and it sent. So I don't know whether it's going to affect it, but this is a, you know, this is an example of, you know, the, the, I, I love for, you know, for the banks to forget about my daughter until she's, 18, but she's already in the system and she's only seven years old. I don't know how that happens. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, but when I trace it back, I believe it has to do with signing her up for a frequent flyer number. And it's a you know company that's been sold her information. They don't know what her age is and that sort of the other thing. But you know, so some of these problems are are are, are very real, um, and she's starting to deal with them. Uh, you know, even at age seven. The interesting thing to me is that there are, as Lotar mentioned, things like the Fair Credit Reporting Act. There's a number of laws that prevent you know, actually the issuance of a credit card to her at seven, I hope. But um, uh, this was, you know, her response at age seven and without any sort of legislation, you know, she sort of, sort of came on this on her own. I, of course, think that that's because she's the most brilliant girl in the world, but I'm a little bit biased. Um, so how does Google think about these things? A lot of, um, well, there's a growing sense and consensus on both sides of the continent that the right to be forgotten explicitly applies to data that's published by a user. So it's information that users themselves you know, post online. Uh, and Google is a, it has a suite of services, of course, that uh, many of us are familiar with. There's our, our search service, but then there's also the, uh, the, the many different you know, platforms that, are, that interact with users, Gmail, uh, YouTube, Google Plus. There's a whole series of things. I'll, I'll give an example here in a minute. But the um, Google believes that, that users should be able to control and delete their data. And all of our products have that ability for users to delete the data that they publish on our platform. Um, you can delete your Gmails, you can delete your posts. Um, there are special uh, provisions, even within Google Plus, for example, that allow you to lock a post so that it can't be forwarded. And that's an, even a, that's, that's an additional level of control that's available even beyond what you can have in, in an email system, right? Because anybody can forward an email anywhere else. Uh, these, the, what, what with Google Plus posts, you're able to uh, unlock them further if you'd like. Um, in the search context, um, because it's the publishers of data that, that, that control 
what's there. In other words, the website owners that the users interact with that control that data. Uh, the Google search is really just a reflection of what's on the internet. And we offer uh, and respect a standard protocol called robots.txt that can allow um, owners of websites, either on a macro level or on a granular level, in other words, at the root of the website or on any particular page, to prevent indexing. Uh, and Google respects that, that protocol. And so, uh, you know, we believe as well that even though the, the internet, I'm sorry, our search is a reflection of what's on the internet, that website owners may choose not to have that information appear in our indexing service, and that's what the robot.txt protocol does. And lastly, uh, you know, because of our focus on user rights, there's a there's a group within Google called the Data Liberation Front, and they're available at dataliberation.org. Uh, this this image here is a is a uh, uh, is, is the logo, and that's kind of what you get when you when you let engineers design their own logo. Um, all of our services are, are, have this ability to to um, what we call Google Takeout, which allows which allows users if they wanted to leave their data and just take it all with them. That, that, that ability is, 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 is built into all of our products. Um, and it's, and it's, 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 it's a core belief that we have. Any new product that's launched has to you know, go through that process or make sure the users are able to take their, their data with them. Um, this is an example of, the, um, of, the, of what we call dashboard. And I'd encourage everybody to look at it if you haven't. It's at google.com dashboard. And it has a number of sections on it. But there's a me on the web section that will show you where your information is reflected on the web, where there are links on the web. Um, and you can control, obviously, your profile within Google and things like that. Um, and then if you click on the link over there about how to remove unwanted content, there is information about how to do that, certainly within Google services, but also how to go about approaching other, you know, billions of websites and computers that interact with the internet to be able to do that and um, um, you know, sort of encourage them to, to help users respect their data. Uh, this is a relatively Google-centric product, um, and one of the beauties of the internet is that uh, is that there's you know an, an ecosystem available to an opportunity for entrepreneurialism, and I think this is a great segue into Michael's product, which is uh, which is a much you know which is a much broader approach. I'll let Michael talk about it, but that there's a lot of opportunities in the ecosystem for great services like Reputation.com to uh, to be developed and to offer users greater ability and insight to see what's on the web and, and uh, provide some advice on how to control it. Thank you. Um, so, so Michael, you, you're also on the way uh, coming from an industry perspective, but obviously from a different direction. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your, your thoughts on the whole right to the motion? Um, yeah, sure. And I, I, I'm going to try to be really short because I think we should you know, move to this kind of the panel version of the panel. Um, yeah. So first, I was reminded because Lothar asked me um, in the green room before we met, I was reminded that a lot of people sort of in that, or some people in the legal community still have a mistaken view about what reputation.com does. We don't send cease and desist letters. We never have. We don't send takedown letters. We're a technology company. We're a deep stack science and technology company. Um, we, we protect uh, reputation and privacy through technology. and. Um, we're probably part of the first wave of sort of liberation tech. Um, how many of you know what liberation tech is or have heard of liberation tech? Okay, good. So um, we are we stand for the proposition that, that you should control um, as much of your digital life as uh, as possible within certain uh, very distinct limits. Um, I, I sort of wish, I mean, I, I like a lot of what Franz said. I sort of wish that Franz did not give this example, this heuristic example about the criminal who was rehabilitated, because I think that just doesn't go over a US audience. And I think you should go well, that that's different. why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> well, but but there, are, there are other examples I think that, that could, there are other examples that could go over in the sure, sense sure. that, um, you know, if, if you say, I think your Amazon example is better in the sense that if you, if you participate in an ecosystem online and then you want to remove yourself from that ecosystem, a lot of us would believe that you should be able to remove yourself from that ecosystem within certain limits of technical feasibility. Um, I, think, I think there are two things I'll say as a, as a starting moment, and, and, and then I, I look forward to the panel because you have a lot of very uh, good discussion already. First is, I'd love to hear from the audience, uh, first is, um, it's an accident that the internet is basically an advertising industry. Right? It's an accident of the internet's development. 
Um, you know, the, if you look at the first trillion dollars of wealth that was created on the internet, um, and you set aside the ISPs and the hardware companies, about 90% of what's left is advertising, which, which, is, uh, which is not the greatest of all human achievements, right? Um, and, and nobody who was at the, at the poor moment of the internet was like, okay, we're gonna really be much better than NBC and Sony, and we're gonna be a, a much better industry built around advertising. What's happened is that there's a, there's a very sophisticated group of, of ecosystem of venture capitalists and entrepreneurs who develop products that, collect, that are free and we use them to collect data and then we monetize the data about you without your permission or consent for purposes you'll never know um, and can never identify. And that's the kind of, so it's an accident of the internet that the vast majority of wealth created on the internet is dependent in some way on the accidental or deliberate confusion of the end user as to what's going on with their data. It's an accident. And we didn't have to do that. Now, by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with the advertising medium of the internet. There are amazing businesses and services that have been built on the back of this. Um, but I don't think that we have to begin our understanding of what the world could be based on what the world is, whether from a commercial or from a regulatory perspective. Now, I am Definitely American. I'm American in the sense that I usually look towards innovation and entrepreneurship and the market on balance to solve these problems. And I put my money and other people's money where my mouth is uh, in the sense that we have built technologies that allow you to control your personal data and remove your data from places uh, from the web you don't want them and allow you to control your digital life and prevent the collection of data about you in the first place. So one of our technologies blocks, I think it's now 180 of the largest ad networks from ever collecting any data about you or storing it in the first place. So you, you prevent the flow of data. You get some of the toothpaste back in the tube, and you also prevent the toothpaste from leaving the tube in the first place. So I generally look towards technology to solve a lot of these problems and, and, and commerce to solve a lot of these problems. On the other hand, when it comes to topics like the right to be forgotten, um, I, you know, I'm glad this the, the tenor of the conversation so far has been as rational as it has been, and as sort of reasonable as it has been, because um, Lothar Franz did a good job of setting up maybe the, the Manichaean kind of holes of opposition. Uh, there's something fundamentally flawed with the way I went to law school, the way lawyers set up questions, right? Where it's like, is a very uh, Manichaean sort of good versus evil, uh, black versus white way that we supposedly expose and exposit truth. Um, and it doesn't necessarily result in a lot of truth. And um, this is a topic, like a lot of topics, about uh, what to do with data or copyright or whatever. Um, I remember from the last cycle, uh, copyright and Eldred also generate the same kind of uh, uh, vituperative kind of energy. SOPA and Pippa did the same thing a few weeks ago. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, emotional energy spent and a lot of black and white energy spent on this stuff. And there, and there doesn't need to be. I think we can have a very reasonable conversation as to what the future can be and whether you should deserve some control over some of, the, some of your data under certain circumstances and so forth. Now, on balance, I generally believe that you should be able to do, um, I believe that I have kind of a true, liber I believe that I have a true libertarian view on this stuff, which is to say that if you know, actually know, that your data will be used in certain ways, not I mean, you know because you've read through a, a, a disclosure document that's 100 pages long, uh, but you actually know and actually cognize the fact that your data will be used in certain ways, and those data, by the way, will be used in those ways and not beyond those ways in very specifically delimited fashion, which is often something that we don't know today, right? So if you give the data to Amazon, it goes to someone else, it goes to the third you don't, the train, the track um, becomes lost. If you actually know, then you're on the hook for the consequences. I think that that, and that's real. I think most people don't actually know, and, um, and I, I'd actually have to say that nobody in this room knows. Um, we are probably some of the world's experts on this topic, and I don't think that we truly know. And so, um, and so there's a big gap, and so it's, there's a libertarian notion that, or the statement that, well, you know, you're using the service, then you're up to the consequences. Well, most people don't actually know how their data are being used. So I, I would like to see a world in which technology, maybe some very light regulation, allows us to control in a knowing and intelligent way how our data are being used. Now, last thought. There are analogs here. There's a lot of sermons wrong about copyright and whether copyright you know, protection would kill the internet, chill the internet. And I was, by the way, part of the original Eldred legal team when I was in college. I was the, you know, the kind of like, you know, little 
thought of a totem pole you know, history researcher on that team. And we brought the other case to the Supreme Court, and then we you know, lost and so forth. We were very annoyed. Um, it, but there was a big stir and drawing, and the idea was that you know if we protect copyright in too much way, then the internet's going to be chilled and killed. And it turns out there's a lot of internet. There's a lot of internet today. There's a lot of media content on the internet. <coughs> on the internet. Um, similarly, trademark. There's a, there's a lot of trademark protection. And so, guess what? There's a lot of internet. And in the case of Germany, which does have a lot of protection for privacy and private information, there's a lot of internet. In fact, Germany is perhaps dollar for dollar, person for person, the powerhouse of e-commerce. Uh, to Lothar sort of suggest the point that uh, that e-commerce could be a way forward. So, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to kill the internet. I don't think the internet should be killed. Nobody here believes that. But, you know, we can see that, that water flows around these rocks and there is wealth to be created and innovation to be had. Last thought on this is, um, right, a lot of lobbyists in Silicon Valley, which is still basically a media business, and I don't, I don't think Patrick and Scoop are talking about generally. A lot of lobbyists in the media business go to DC and they say, "Well, if you do X or Y, you're going to kill innovation." And innovation, <laughs> innovation is a word that Silicon Valley lobbyists use to mean money. It's a, it's a, it's a code word for revenue. And um, and because it sounds very important, innovation sounds very important. You go to Congress and say, "Well, this is going to kill innovation." And then Congress says, oh, we don't want to do that. That sounds very bad. I don't want to be responsible for killing innovation. Innovation just means revenue. And, and right now, the kind of revenue that we know how to make most in Silicon Valley is advertising revenue, which again, depends on the accidental or deliberate confusion of the end user as to what's going on with their data. So uh, I think we can do better. I think there's all kinds of innovation that will come out of uh, uh, you know, intelligent moving of the, of the rocks in the river so that the uh, water flows differently. Uh, and I, I'm very optimistic about the future, right? and I hope you will be too. Thanks. Thanks. I'm actually going to ask a follow-up for you, Michael. I think that I'd like to just kind of take a step down from abstract legal and technical concepts and talk about the core of what we're really talking about here, which is how does online data really potent, potentially affect real lives? And that's, I think, something that you, Reputation.com, has to deal with daily. So I'm, I was wondering if you could kind of lay out some of the, you know, without giving away names, yeah. um, some of the horror stories that you see how people's digital footprints actually end up affecting their lives. Okay, their so, okay great. So that's good. So I'll give a couple of horror stories, and, and one, a couple will be more horrible than the others. Uh, because I don't think that we should focus on the kind of the most uh, grievous heuristics. We should also focus on something that the sort of more low-level anxiety that affects a lot of people. So, um, you know, we, you know, there's a there's a there's a, a a very sympathetic story of a young woman who um, who uh, was in a car accident and uh, she basically flipped her car. And it was a, it was a um, she was not under the influence of any drugs or alcohol, and she uh, her car flipped and there's a convertible and her head was uh, just chopped in half, right? And um, one of the guys from the California Highway Patrol took pictures of the scene, and uh, which was his job to do, and uh, brought them back to uh, the police station, and which was his job to do, put them in the system, plus or minus, which was his job to do, and then someone else at, the, at, that, at that station uh, sent them to his friend or her friend, which was not the job to do, and then that person published them on the internet. And then people started sending him to uh, her parents. Um, and uh, and then, you know, and so this is one of those things, these genies, that's very hard to put back in the bottle once you get it out there. And it's very, very difficult to uh, do that even through copyright law. It was the subject of a very large uh, lawsuit, which actually five, six years later has just been settled. But these photographs permeate the web now. Um, and there are reasons for that. After realizing that they were fighting up the battle against the CHP, the family decided to go national with the story, and then that, of course, propagated the photographs further. So that's a that's a look. It's a it's a it's a it's a dramatic story which tells you know a story of how the something which now probably is newsworthy because all the stuff that happened wasn't newsworthy at the beginning and propagated through uh, some small malfeasance by a few people and then the internet kind of took over. The reason I don't like to dwell on that story is that while it's very, certainly very dramatic and certainly very sympathetic, which assists the argument that I often stand for, it's also hard to relate. It's not a relatable story. Most of us will not have such a tragedy happen to us. Most of us will not have. Such a thing. And here are the things that are important about that. One, she was not responsible for the posting of her photograph, but she was dead. And a lot of people sort of knee jerk react and say, well, people are responsible for what happens to them when they post things to the internet and then the internet uh, exposes them. Well, in this case, clearly she was not responsible. Clearly her family was not responsible. Um, 
And interestingly, and, and also by the way, uh, the interesting point of law here for the lawyers in the room, which I think is probably all of you, uh, she had just turned, I believe, 18. And in consequence of her being majority aged, she was not able, she had no standing because she was dead in front of the court as to the rights of her publicity. Now, isn't that retarded? <laughs> right? And so, anyway, the law was about to change. The CHP finally said, okay, we'll, we'll, make, a, we'll make a huge you know, settlement. And the, the law was about to change, and it was very, very sympathetic. And the law was going to have to change to make that uh, rectified. Now, that's kind of the one side of the story, very, very, very dramatic story. And thank God that doesn't happen to most people most of the time. But here's, what I, here's the kind of the low-level stuff that affects all of us. All of us are having our digital DNA used and mined in ways that we never knew would happen and we never signed up for in the first place. So I see a world in which, and by the way, Google, I think today or yesterday, announced this very interesting program where they're going to run an experiment where they're going to try to pay you 25 bucks uh, to see if they can you know, sell your data. So the idea is we're going to give you a gift card for $25 to see if they're going to, then that gives Google the right to sell your data uh, 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 and so forth. And I was asked by a journalist, well, what do you think the data is worth? That's well, Google's gross margin is usually about 90%. So imagine it's worth about 250 bucks. Uh, we'll see if the experiment works. But I believe that that's a better way to do it, that, that there are companies that can share in the bounty of your data, whether it's medical data or banking data and so forth. Um, and instead of, of, of requiring us to believe that there's this implied contract where we log onto the web and now everything about us is subject to the sale and use by people we never can identify for purposes we'll never know, uh, with third parties we'll never be able to identify, ever. You know, if we describe that in a different context, if I told you there's going to be a world in which everything about you is known, and by the way, we know a lot about you, right? Everything about you is known, and it's going to be shared for purposes we'll never be able to identify or never know, you say, wow, that sounds like a totalitarian state. And that's sort of the <coughs> accidental permeation of the web. Now, specifically, on an example of this, Right now, the basic cons the basic sort of objection that certain people have is, well, you know, ad digital advertising is intrusive. Well, you know, if I want to see Nikes and my wife wants to see Manolo Blahniks, it doesn't really bother me personally. Okay, it doesn't really bother me that I get a certain ad that is probably more relevant. They're not always more relevant than some other ad. But what's bother what bothers me is what what, I, what we called five years ago would be coming, and now we know it's coming. The same data sets are and will be used to assess insurance premiums. R will be used to assess access to healthcare. R will be used to, uh, to assess opportunities for finance and uh, financial opportunity. And the LOFAR correctly points out that there's some regulation on the periphery of this, they're not at the core of what I just said. It's very, 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 very hyper hard to prove. I believe, and I'm going to say just I believe, because it's a public forum, I think it was WellPoint as an insurance company, and, and, and so I'm paraphrasing. Anyway, a large insurance company a year or two ago was uh, caught sort of red-handed, uh, cutting people off for um, preemptively for healthcare coverage just as they started to show signs of getting sick. And they were caught, man, boom, red-handed. And there was some document that said, yeah, we are definitely going to be evil. And then someone, you know, said, they found the document, oh my god, you're definitely going to be evil. And so they found, they find this company, the company's moved on, but, you know, we know that insurance companies which have to do this for their own commercial reasons, do things like this. Now, imagine the same thing happening at 10 times scale and it's totally untraceable forever. Because we know from the internet that the 35-year-old healthy woman is friends on Facebook with the same one, the 65-year-old woman who shares her last name who's got a, who's a fan of a breast cancer survivor page. And we know that 35-year-old healthy woman pointed her own browser twice in one month to a cancer treatment center website. And that same 35-year-old healthy woman received an email about cancer in the last 30 days. Now those three data points belong to three different companies and they are separated and kept distinct by the grace of God and three founders right now who are behaving in a certain way that we probably approve. We assume we approve. But that's a very, very fragile separation. It's a very, very fragile uh, bulwark against, the, against what we know is happening. We know the Wall Street Journal has now said that the insurance companies are collecting social media data to make a sense of And by the way, they have to. It's, it's commercially impossible for them not to. Um, and I think there's something better that we can do. And I'm, just, I, I'm very, again, I remember, I made very optimistic that we can. Is that responsive? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for that. So, hey, 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 hey. I'm going to follow my questions. <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, the, the big balancing act here is free expression versus, versus privacy. The European Commission proposals do include carve-outs for 
journalism, historical purposes, scientific purposes, and artistic expression. But the thing that, that, that I'm curious about and which I, I addressed in the story I wrote this morning is, are we gonna run into some definitional, definitional challenges? What judge or regulatory body can say who's a journalist, who's a historian, who's an artist? Um, even you know, Google makes, uh, does, does research in artificial intelligence and machine translation using, using data. So um, are they gonna be accepted? So I guess I'm just curious, practically, speak, practically speaking, can we clarify these sorts of definitions uh, and make sure we're you know, uh, you know, promoting the public good of privacy without detracting from the public good of free expression? Uh, Professor Vera, would you wanna start with that? I'm not sure I can relate well to what you just said. I would have wanted to go back to the opposition that was clearly uh, pointed out between the EU and the US. I think we should be clear on the fact that there is there a total clash. And it goes back to attitudes towards the market, belief in what the state can do for you or against you. And I think that there's no point in trying to think that one has it better than the other. So Lothar has the faith of the convert. That's beautiful, you know, <laughs> believe that the US got it right. The problem is that the EU does not agree, does not feel that way. The relationship of a EU person to the market just does not resemble the attitude that a citizen here has or consumer here has to the market and to the beauty of the uh, market of the ideas. Interesting uh, juxtaposition, the idea that we would have a market of ideas. I mean, there seems to be an obsession for the market in this country that the EU does not have. Now, my point, the only one, is not to die De de uh, de uh, demonize the US or whatever it does, it's fine. Have it. Just do not pretend that this is universal truth. And when I see people trying to act against corporations that typically are seated in this country, they lose. So that's a thing that bothers me that suddenly, in the name of something that is whole sacred, you know, who would challenge the beauty of free speech? What is suddenly losing sight of the fact that this is not the only way to look at things, and that there are competing values that challenge the absolute nature of free speech as it is understood here. So to go back to uh, Michael's uh, point or challenge or observation that my example uh, he regretted the choice of my example. I, I want to briefly uh, insist on it. First of all, I do think that this guy uh, has a right to be left alone. I find that good. I don't ask the US to share that view, but this sort of puritanical idea that what's bad, always bad, is something I do not share, okay? One can have been bad and then move on. What worries me, and this is the reason I chose this example, because I think it's rooted in a certain understanding of how privacy ultimately works. It's an old example. The example you gave about the woman whose picture is taken is an old case of a famous Swiss painter, Hodler, who was snapshot on his deathbed, and the whole family thought it was disgusting because they were hurt in their feelings. They had just witnessed the death of their father and they didn't want, just because he was famous, his picture to be taken and to be uh, mediatized. So I insist on this example because my example of the former crook, I think, raises tremendous techni uh, technological problems. How can I avoid to have Google keep on talking or remove actually that news uh, and you know how can I at some point say look what was newsworthy 20 years ago now no longer is if I have the information digital information allows to to just jeopardize uh, the actual right to be forgotten so I don't mean to insist but I think the example is interesting to the extent that 
technologically, I'm not sure we can enforce it. I'm sorry to not follow up on, <laughs> on your question. No, that's, that's fine. Um, Patrick, I'm curious what, what, what you think, given that, that I brought up the Google example, and um, you know, as the European Commission sort of moves forward here, do you think that this that they will run into this in sorts of challenges in figuring out how, in a practical way, they can define these rules? Right, and that's you know certainly the crux of the issue. I mean, defining the right to be forgotten is still something that is a live discussion. The the change um, uh, from a directive which has been in place from 1995 through a regulation is a, is, a, is a completely new proposal in many ways. And for those of you that are um, that may not be as familiar with the European law, there's two basic forms of European uh, legislation. There is a directive, which is uh, a proposed legislation that is then implemented in 27 different countries. Sometimes those implementations can be different. And the proposal that's on the table now is what's known as a regulation. And the regulation has what is called direct effect. And so it's just a single law. By analogy, it's, um, and it's an imperfect analogy. It's the equivalent of passing a federal law in the United States. It has the same effect across the, across the country. And so it's important to get this right. And we look forward to engaging in that discussion. The proposed regulation just came out over the, you know, about, about, about two weeks ago. The thing to keep in mind, though, again, is that there is a, um, there's a, there's a fundamental belief here in both the, in both the European continent and in the United States about freedom of expression. That's important. And the, uh, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights was very forward thinking in that, in that respect and, and made a technologically neutral proposal when they said that um, in Article 19 that, um, that the freedom of expression is the right to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas to any media regardless of frontiers. So the role of Google, again, is to reflect what's on the web. The horrible things that we're talking about here are, 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 really, um, are, are really bad things. Um, but it's not Google that controls those things. There are other websites that control those things. And, and that's, the, that's the issue. Is the, it's important for for the publishers to be respectful of that data, and for users to, uh, you know, to have those rights, we, like any other, uh, like any other company, have to respect the rule of law. And we are, of course, um, taking down uh, results and, and doing things that we have to do when there are when court orders and when the law so mandates. And we have a transparency report that's publicly available that shows worldwide uh, when those takedowns take place and the type of nature of those takedowns. Um, what I wanted to ask you, uh, part of your role, as I understand it, is to help uh, U.S. companies as they're building intellectual property and products uh, to ensure that it will comply with international law. So assuming that these, these rules do go into effect, I'm curious um, whether it's going to be a challenge for companies here to build products and, and privacy policies that are going to fit um, both, both sets of rules if, they're gonna, if there's ways to sort of divvy them up and you know, apply different rules in different places, or if they're just going to sort of opt to move in more, uh, toward more conservative rules, the same reason that web app companies uh, want to do an HTML. They, can just, they do it once and, and be done with it. The, the question how this would affect the internet globally operating companies who are basically taking their cards and developing for the US market, they get adopted in Europe even if the law is differently there, and then it's very difficult for European regulators to enforce their laws. How that would play out will depend how it's going to be enforced. That's why there's so much focus in this regulation about whether there's going to be an EU wide sanction regime whereby companies would be fined by turnover, which for some companies would be billions of dollars for a violation of privacy laws, which is a very scary thing. The reality is that Europe, with its relatively broad laws in the past, has not enforced it much. I say the first 30 years of privacy laws in Germany, I mean, we taught it at school. I, when I clerked for a court, I had some cases on the table. It was a complete non-event. Damages weren't available. We have no class actions, and the regulators did not. So 30 years, there was just not anything done about these very, very broad, restrictive laws. Similarly, with the cookies regulation, I think cookies have been prohibited in Europe and required affirmative option consent for, for most of what people do with cookies forever. That's always been the law. 
then the European directive comes and say, well, you can place the cookie with opt-out, and, and people didn't even comply with that. And now there's a new directive that says we really, really mean it, and people have to really, really, really get opt-in consent. Now nobody's doing it either. So I think that the European approach, having these somewhat unrealistic, super restrictive rules, and then not doing anything about enforcement, would probably lead to unless that changes, that companies here in the US will still do whatever they want, and the European users which in a democracy should be heard, are adopting these services, possibly because they don't understand them. That is certainly a risk. Um, but I think that would be my <coughs> practical forecast. Now, to go to your earlier question, and I'm also pick up on the fact, how, how would this actually work, or what would the effect of this be? Would it be very difficult to administer this right to be forgotten? I think all the examples that we use could be solved with existing European laws. The guy who wanted to be forgotten, can already assert the existing European laws and say, is it, can my name be mentioned in the newspaper? Most of the time in Europe, they don't put the name into the newspaper. We don't, I mean, here in California law, sex offenders can be looked up on the internet with their address and so on. That's something we don't do in Europe at all. And that's already, these cases, most of these cases can be solved with the existing law. Also, the um, examples that you mentioned, Michael, there were these um, possible abuses of health information, we have HIPAA on it. And, and it is, I think it, it is somewhat confusing if we use examples where companies break the law that already exists and then make an argument that the law needs to be changed. I think that's just a matter of enforcement. I think most of these cases can be solved with existing laws, and I don't think this right to be forgotten needs to be introduced. I think the big change that this right to be forgotten, as it is in Article 38 or so of its post regulation, the big change will be that it will allow people to go after the platforms such as Google, Facebook, and so on that are content neutral, they're not publishers, they don't typically make the decision to publish things, but they allow other private consumers to publish. And the law would then, um, the way it reads right now, is that um, a platform operator would have to go into individual users' accounts, their pages, their Twitter accounts, their whatnot, and ask the platform provider to pull things out there. I think with cloud computing companies where they allow Dropbox and other things, mega upload, although that uh, didn't go so well in recent days, I've seen. Uh, but these companies, they would be somehow required to go into user accounts and find things, which is a privacy intrusion right there. And I think that would, to, to your previous and to the current questions, I think that would be the biggest challenge to find rules for that. Now, I agree with um, Professor Vero who said earlier we should trust judges that they can work it out. I agree with that. I mean, this is not inherently a completely different area. But I, I just don't see the proposition is made that this is necessary. I think the existing laws protect people in most cases where, where the law is not enforced. We don't need to pass another law. We need to start enforcing it or trust technology solutions that help with it. Um, trust the marketplace boss companies who have been referred to a couple of times just because you're in the panel, there's a lot of other companies you shouldn't be singled out, but Google is addressing it because the users care about it to some extent, so they will do that because that's what the users want. But I don't think the case is made that we need to dramatically change the law, um, do away with free services on the internet that are advertising finance. There are paid TV services and there are paid services on the internet and the users get to choose. I don't think the case has been made that the data collection for marketing purpose really hurts people. We can point to particular examples, and in these examples is usually criminals, ID theft, the government being aggressively enforcing things that they shouldn't be enforced in the first place, and then some kind of creepiness factor that makes us uncomfortable. But I don't, I've not seen the case made how this amassing of user profiles and advertising and so on hurts people except in circumstances where somebody's breaking the law anyhow. And then I say we need more enforcement and we need more education. I agree with that too. And uh, maybe people should not take driver's licenses anymore, but really get a license to go on the internet because they don't understand these technologies and how they can hurt themselves. Maybe that's what we need to do that people get more responsible and get more educated on it. Um, I'm wearing one t-shirt here, uh, Zynga, it's a social networking um, gaming platform, it's very interesting, it's also very complex how they process data and so on. So they created a little privacy um, game where people can learn how their um, data is being processed, which I think is a great idea. 
And I think that might be a solution to get people more educated so they can make choices about it. I'm personally not worried what Amazon and my bank is doing with the data to each other. I'm a little more worried about identity theft, people losing my data. I'm, I'm worried about people lying to me in their privacy policy. That's certainly a concern. And I think um, I'm worried sometimes about the government, what they will do to me if they uh, knew where I parked incorrectly yesterday and so on. And, and I think there's other solutions to go after those kinds of culprits and not just um, do away with Web 2.0 as we've come to appreciate. Does anyone else have any uh, different response or want to respond to anything that Bill Clark said there? All right, so we're about, uh, about 15 minutes to the end. Um, so we're going to invite uh, anyone in the audience to come up. There are microphones on either side if you just want to walk down. We'll start over here. Hi, I'm Did you say one? I'm Darren Soto, Tech Freedom, it's an on now. Uh, I could ask a lot of questions about this panel, but let me just take one. Franz, we just went through something here in the U.S. where uh, not only was a really terrible copyright bill uh, tried to, to be pushed through, but it was done so by people who, by their own admission, very proudly said they had no clue how the internet worked and what it would actually mean and how we would implement that. And so you can understand why some of us, perhaps all of us here today, were a little sensitive uh, and maybe alarmed to hear you say you're, quote, not a technical person, and you have no idea how the rights to be forgotten would be implemented, but you're sure that we need to have one and the law should mandate it. So my question for you and for everyone else here in general is, this um, all sounds very well and good in theory, but what does it actually mean in the real world where you know intentions don't really matter because what really matters is implementability and, um, and consequences for, for users, and in particular for, for the ecosystem, I'll just add, very briefly, to, to on top of that, that in response to Michael, I, I'm a little surprised to hear you say that, that the internet is just accidentally an advertising-based model, because all media have been accidentally advertising-based models because of the economics of information for centuries, um, because that's how information gets funded, because its marginal cost is zero. And so media that like the question that the internet is a media business, it's a media business. You just said that it's not accidental that the internet is a media business because it's a media business. Like producing content, like producing magazine content and TV content, other sorts of content, is subject to the same economics, and they have fallen into advertising models, not because they want to, but because of the economics of it. So that's one of the consequences that I'd like to hear talked about, which is it's not just the practical and technical, but the economic. You're still getting your sewer enough to just replace your content. Okay. Well, all, all, all I'm suggesting is that, that that's an economic conversation, and to assert that somehow this is just an accident, and we can wait a wand, and, find a different model for the internet that doesn't require advertising and where the consequences of, for example, many rights be forgotten don't really matter because we can find other revenue streams. But that's a very tall assertion and I think it would really be incumbent on you to suggest how that would work. Amazon, Zynga, yeah. eBay. Right. So that anyway, the practical consequences of the trade-offs. Okay, quick, move on to the professor. Just Aspects. thank you for your question. I think it's a great one, and I confess my ignorance uh, right away, and I'm happy to repeat it. All I <laughs> am struck by is the fact that a certain number of values of entitlements have been around for a long time and still seem to be in the air. Uh, 78 or 80 percent of the Europeans ask if they want to have more control over their personal data. Say yes, I want to be able to go after uh, what uh, what's out there and I that I do not control. And I I just want to uh, suggest that just because we have new technology does not mean that we need to say, oh well, there's nothing we can do. Uh, it seems to me that we can reflect on a certain number of preoccupations. When I see uh, Facebook users be essentially the targets of advertising that they don't even realize, I find that problematic. Oh, but you're free to open an account on Facebook. No, I'm not. I practically am not. I am, because I'm an old curmudgeon, 
but none of my kids is able to afford the fact of not having, and I think these guys should know what is going on on Facebook. They should have a, a way of realizing that they are actually being exploited like and pressed like lemons. That they are interesting to the extent that they provide naively information. And that this whole thing that's called you know, a social network for friendship is actually a huge commercial enterprise that makes money with them. So I admit that there are huge technological problems which, which I do not master, but I think my concern is a fair one. People said the same way, so you said not even ask you to type this, someone else will figure it out. Okay. Wait a second, so but there's a frail team, it's a frail team, but we're at the law school, right? Very near a lawyer, right? <coughs> and so there's a, there's, a, there's a frailty, and you come from a very libertarian you know, kind of point of view and stuff, and I get it. And that there's a frailty where you have a bunch of lawyers or legal trained people who are trying to develop regulation outside the context of engineering and so forth. But it's also one of the big frailties of internet discussion that engineers kind of have one set of conversations usually with one another, and lawyers usually have another set of conversations with one another. And so, you know, you're right, the devil's off in the details. But that's true with any piece of regulation. And unless you're just anti government or anti law, you understand that is part of the discussion of any kind of regulation of law. And it's important that we go lightly and gingerly and intelligently, and it's important that these laws not be written just by lobbyists from one side or the other, or by people who are informed. Um, unfortunately, actually, comparing US and Europe, and it's a shame in the US ever to cite Europe as an example of anything, but let's just so do it for a second. In the US, basically our governments are by lawyers, <laughs> right? including lawyers who govern these topics. In Europe, there are engineers very, very closely involved in a lot of these topics. So, um, I don't think you have to be an engineering expert to make a statement about rights, uh, or an engineering expert to make a statement against the law. So we're here, please. Hi. Um, I'm a journalist, and uh, as a group, we tend to be very self-absorbed. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll offer a couple of occupational observations in hopes that they may be pertinent to the discussion. Uh, one is that uh, I, I have never encountered uh, in more than 30 years uh, any problems with ground rules with people uh, was on the record and off the record until I started dealing almost <coughs> exclusively with very highly paid influential people whose whole, uh, whose whole living is based on their public image and uh, their manipulating public opinion who are seem perfectly happy to give uh, presentations at public events and then claim to be shocked that somebody might be sitting there reporting to the world, notwithstanding that uh, half the world is blogging. Uh, and this is, um, and the other half is tweeting. Um, the, the, the point, if there is one here, is uh, I think we're dealing in, in some ways with two very important classes of people. So the point is, I've never had a problem with ground rules with people with language problems, with people who clean toilets, who don't know how to deal with the media. It's only a problem with people uh, in, in a very rarefied world. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. This is, the point here is, if there is one, is that if you've got a, a small group of people who's very publicity conscious and who's, uh, who, whose whole day revolves around or ought to revolve around uh, controlling the, uh, the information about them, and you've got a whole other group of people who's been, uh, is presumably more or less clueless, and, and uh, maybe these uh, need to be treated in, in somewhat different ways. The other observation I make is that uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting personal experience to go from spending decades having a vested interest in disclosure by the pound uh, and then having block shopper uh, uh, post the purchase price of a house that one's inherited on behalf of a number of heirs uh, uh, that could only be of interest in a neighborhood where one hasn't lived for decades and become uh, uh, the object of God knows who's kidnapping fantasies, or uh, financial planning and marketing designs. Anyone want to react to that? Okay, we'll move on again. Is it okay to ask a natural question? Or do I have to <laughs> Please do. Uh, okay, Franz, I think when I came in, you were saying that you believe in the right to be forgotten because you believe that, you, that, that people can become good. Yep. But if you erase the, edit, the 
But that's from the internet. You're not really inferring to change, are you? I mean, change means we have to be able to see the whole process. So is it really affirming change to erase this one? That's a principle, not an implementation mm -hmm. detail. I can figure out how to do that. I don't want to erase history. I think in history, in, including the history of people, is interesting. But there comes a point where their personal identity no longer requires publicity because time has moved on. So we want to know that in a, at a certain time, at a certain moment, there were certain people who were engaging into certain things. But if those certain people are still around and have changed their lives, I do think that their dignity entitles them to respect to the fact that what they used to do is now in the past. I, I'm not saying that it is something easy. And actually, uh, the, the enforcement of this right to be forgotten is never given as a matter of automatic application of the right to be forgotten. There's always going to be a balancing out of competing interests. On the one hand, we want to know what has happened. On the other hand, we have this difficult task of engaging into weighing whether the private interest of a private person is now competing in a significant way with that public interest. And I'm not too alarmed at the idea that we can find a line, that we can find, because often there's a fear that there would be a chilling effect. What are journalists going to do if they can't just systematically say exactly what's happening? Well, they may engage into weighing and to saying that this is here perhaps not as newsworthy. And I think the notion of newsworthiness is important. We fought for free speech in order to ensure democracy. To, you know, in order to ensure that there would be a solid public debate where disagreeable things would be said. And I don't want that free speech that is so valuable be transformed into a weapon for massive corporations who get larger and richer every year. It is a confusion here in genre. Free market, free enterprise is, should be kept separate from free speech. So. There's a balancing activity here, which I think we can engage in. You over here? Yeah. Um, at one level, uh, the discussion about the right uh, to be forgotten has to do with uh, about setting a baseline of privacy controls that would exist sort of across the internet so you don't have to go side by side and scrutinize the inscrutable privacy statements. And you just have the sense of, of you know, that this part of the my data will be protected in this way. And I think, Mike, we, we spoke to this. And so what I'm wondering then, if the right to be forgotten is not the right regulatory mechanism to ensure this baseline of privacy, and given the fact that there are incredible financial benefits to data retention and to sort of the, the cross-pollination of data between sites, as, as was again brought up to some of the, uh, the parade of horribles about, you know, merging data mining and how this could be used to keep people out of insurance pools or what have you. I mean, the idea is that there's a lot of money to be made from the data. So if we're not going to use this sort of regulatory mechanism of the right to be forgotten um, to ensure a baseline of privacy, then, then what might be some suggested other alternatives to this? I mean, I, they, they could be regulatory, they could be private. I mean, I would say we go to the, to the evil. So if your problem is that insurance companies should not be able to kick people out because they're sick, then we need to regulate insurance companies. I don't think we need to regulate information. If we have a problem with the fact that criminals shouldn't be named in newspapers, and I agree with you personally, if I read a European newspaper about somebody without the name in there, and then I read it here in the US with the name, there's no additional information to me that I know who that is, except that I can look their picture up immediately on, on, on Google Images and so on and find something out about the person. I think that could be separate, but let's regulate newspapers if that's important to us. But I'm against um, the notion that we then have to create this really broad um, new law, which will be very difficult to implement, where we haven't really made a case for that that is the problem. I think the problem is in all these other areas, we can, can limit the government what they should do, and there's a digital due process coalition that 
absolute rein in what we've done here after 9-11 with the Patriot Act, and we started regulating insurance companies. We have HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability Act, that has privacy protections. I think that is the answer. So on exactly, on exactly this point, the, the, um, so I, I think it's very easy for us you know, to have this sort of Manichaean debate between kind of, you know, business and, the, and regulation. So, um, so I was just, I'm going to say it, I was just in Davos. And in Davos, I was a part of a discussion uh, with a very, very, very senior, including chief executive representatives of very large companies that have enormous amounts of data, as much as Facebook and Google does and so forth. And a lot of them were looking for either intelligent, um, uniform regulation that allows them to know how to operate, or allows them to use their data in ways that they're not now allowed to do, or some set of very clear norms that have yet to emerge from, from business, which I'm also very happy to support, um, around, for example, very hyper clear, easy, and comprehensive transparency around how data are being used. So even they will say, look, you know, in a given course of a week, we might contact, we might query someone's um, uh, bank account 40 times as part of the transaction you know, universe that we're part of, and it doesn't make sense to get approval every one of those 40 times from the customer to allow that to be queried, but we need to query it to do our business and our job and in ways that are very successful in 30, 40 years of history have allowed us to do. However, it would be useful and interesting, they say, if we could have some red light, green light, good housekeeping seal of approval from some third party, it could be a nonprofit, it could be whatever, it could be, I know there's an effort at Stanford Law School now where there's a kind of a, an attempt to normalize in a red light, green light way some privacy policy information. A very easy, simple to use scorecard that says, yes, we're using data in ways that are as described, that are delimited, that, and we can confirm they're delimited so that when we send data to a third party, it's actually not going beyond their hands, and we know that, there's a kind of audit trail <coughs> there. And it makes it very easy. So there, there are a lot of ways to kind of get there. And, and I, I just want us not to think that the alternative to the status quo is Stalinism. You know what I mean? It's like this, this is view that some people have. That it's like anything that's not exactly what's today is just going to result in the death of the web. It's not true. Which not, not, that, uh, as your answer suggests and the question suggests also. I think we're, we're challenged and we're faced with a new problem, which is the fact that we have come to an age where forgetting is increasingly hard. And this is not very human. In my humble, non-techie perspective, I find that to be a little scary. And so we need to realize that the internet is doing things to us that we are not yet used to. It used to be that one could tell a story and then human memory is being what it was, we would forget. Now. There's a threat that we won't forget, or that it, it, it comes. And here I, I read the guy who just wrote a good book, I think, about, you know, Delete, Meyer, whatever his name is. Yeah, I think it's a, it, this is what we're faced with. And I do not claim that the right to be forgotten is this wonderful, powerful thing that we should apply blindly. No, but let's realize, let's be creative about what's happening to us. I just want one point on your story. You could have gone into the archive of the Neue Zürcher Zeitung and you would have looked up that story about this person before too. That's a very different book. Okay. It's more efficient what we do now that we can <coughs> immediately and that's progress and that's innovation and we cannot stop the information age with, with regulation. But I think the case is not made that any of these examples require the right to be forgotten because I think the existing laws cover all of those problems. Whether the guy is named or not, that's existing law. That's not the right to be forgotten. The well, question is whether you can go and burn old newspapers so that people forget. <laughs> That's something that comes from George Orwell. That was one of the things the Ministry of Information does in this story, that they change the history records of things. I don't think that is, that is, there is no case made for that, but we should take more questions. Yeah, we're over time, but it looks like just one more question, so. Thank you. I have, I have three quick comments. I'd like to get some reactions to it. Uh, first, I, I have to dispute the point that content and the internet are all about commerce. I'm not, I'm unaware of the advertising model for Wikipedia, and I'm unaware of an advertising model for the earliest uh, skyrocketing uh, popularity of Facebook or, or even of Google search. I think there are a lot of examples where people come to and populate and make and, and build up structures on the internet, based on content that have nothing to do with advertising or revenue. But, but um, 
I've, I've noticed here a little bit of discussion that's similar to a lot of the discussion over, over piracy. Everybody starts out saying there are these bad things called piracy. And you start you start looking into it more. And then the, the discussion more. But, but there are people making a lot of money out of this. And that's what we don't like. And, and, and they're, they're, they're really profiting from your information. And that's a problem. To me, that's a separate question entirely from whether there is a problem. Whether somebody's making money is a separate question. But the point I'd really like to get to is this. I, I think that this concept is fundamentally extremely pernicious. There are whole countries and whole societies would, that would like the world to forget their histories. This country would like the world to forget what we did to Native Americans. And Turkey and Germany would love for people to forget their histories. So much that there, in fact, is the political phrase, never forget, that has a point. The same thing is true of you know, I'm sure uh, Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black would have preferred that people not have known that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I'm sure that local politicians would like for people to know that they didn't have certain financial interests. I'm sure that high school principals would like for people to know. So it goes on down the chain. I don't think there's any stock anymore. And I don't believe that judges can be entrusted with the determination of when something gets forgotten, who gets to forget it, and what gets to be forgotten. So I really would like, uh, I think, for Franz and, and Michael particularly to respond to some of these. Thank you. I'll, I'll offer one comment. I know it was directed from Michael, but I do want to offer one comment. There's a lot there. Um, the freedom of expression principles are so so critical to, uh, to, to, to many of the uh, democratic institutions around the world, and that's something that we certainly need to preserve. But the comment I really want to make is on the economics, because there have been a lot of discussion today on at the panel about economics and how we value it and the, the money that's made. It's actually a fairly new science to look at the internet economy. Traditionally, people would look at the valuation of companies that are publicly traded and sort of extrapolate and say that's you know that's the money that's made. And the Wikipedia example is an excellent one. If you take any GDP measure and try to apply it to, to, to what Wikipedia brings to the world, that value is zero. And that just doesn't make intuitive sense to us. And so you know, for those of you that are here that are, that are looking at opportunities to study uh, you know, economics and the internet in the future, there's, a, there's fertile ground there for work to be done. Uh, we've just published a website as part of Davos called valueoftheweb.com that, that hosts a number of uh, studies on, on the value of the internet economy. It represents, on average, among the uh, developed economies, 3.4% of GDP, according to some of the analysis that are fairly new. A lot of opportunities to, to look into that. Um, and that's a little bit off topic on the, in the area of right to be forgotten, but a very relevant one when you can put it in the context of economic value. I, I think you're quite, um, I'm not a place to learn. I think your questions are statements were very good, obviously very passionately and you know felt right. And there are two ways to kind of go about it. So you know you gave the example of American America and you wanted to forget about its treatment of the Native Americans. And like if you ask me if like I'm on the other side of that topic, I'm just not. You know what I mean? I'm just not on the other. I don't want America through this thing that we just call the right to be forgotten, which has to do with your personal data and your you know information, to translate into. Are being able to delete the history of you know the sad march of the Cherokee. It's just it's not connected in my in like any universe. So I, I you know it's important that we that we look at this like any other topic, which is a topic of intense uh, complication and complexity, and also a topic of of a place where we can't agree. Um, I guess I'm just more keyed up about the idea that um, if uh, you know if, if if you decide that, you know you want to post a picture to three friends on a social network, um, you know you should be able to remove that picture. Like I think that's a more basic starting place. For this for the statement, and if and if you if you really kind of take the I've never met someone I've never met someone who really really stands for what they think they stand for when they say they don't believe in privacy. Because I've offered at different times to really take them to the mat on that question and offer to 
just experiment with their lives and publish everything about their lives that they like, you know? But they've never taken me up on it. Uh, and so I just, I think, you know, this, there's this heuristic that we you know, and I, I just, I, 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 <coughs> I went to law school. I just, you know, the, the least fun panels to be on in some ways are law school panels because they're always, they're always there's this notion that we're taught in law school that like you say absolutely it is true in all circumstances, and then the other guy will say no, it is never true in any circumstances. Then the truth will emerge, and that's just not true. It's just false. <laughs> and it's this oppositional approach. Why do you, you know? say that so absolutely? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. Most of the time. Um, Different way to go about this, and, and and I think your your point of view about never forget and always remember is very well taken and well felt and well, well articulated. And I can't disagree with it. I mean, as you stated it, right? But I'm not, you know, the opposite of what of what the opposite of the, like or the opposite of the right to forget is or the right to forget is not. Uh, well, the consequence of the right to forget is not that like you know you know Hitler wins. It's like it's just you know it's like. Holy well, that sounds bad, you know. But, so, so I guess I'm against this thing, you know. So it's just, you know, it's just like it's always like that, and you know, and it's like, and, and by the way, this is like 99 percent of us in this room would say, well, Fox News is doing one thing, and CNN is doing the other thing, and like Mitt Romney is lying, and Barack Obama is saying another thing else. It's like let's not do that ourselves. Like in order to have this conversation, let's move beyond that. They kind of Antipodean, Manichaean kind of debate that we have accused public figures of having. Let's just have a real conversation, and then we can maybe govern ourselves better. Uh, also, also, just a point, like, Baron, I stand for commerce on this topic. Like, I'm the guy who built a company standing for the idea that we can solve this in the free market, and we should be able to solve this in the free market. So, you know, this, this is, let's I, say, optimistic. I don't want to be the, the socialist Bolshevist of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> commerce is wonderful and is, of course, essential. I would like commerce, to be honest, and, and, and true sell products for what they are and in all transparency. When I hear, you just spoke about Fox News and I'm being remembered of this dark episode of this New York governor who was caught, you know, against prostitution, of course he's caught with one. And then one goes after the woman, of course she makes two million in one day so she cannot complain about her sudden publicity. But there goes the grandfather of this woman who's being chased somewhere in New Jersey at 9 o'clock by Fox Channel, and who says, I've got nothing to do with this woman. <laughs> That's the grandfather. And indeed, on earth, why would you not leave him alone? Of course you know that chasing the grandfather is going to make audience. It's not about free speech. It's about something that is presented as free speech that is actually making bucks in a cheap way. So. Why do I want judges to, to, to balance out these competing interests? Because they're the only ones I can trust on Earth to try to engage in a reasonable conversation about what can be done, until when, and how far, without threatening something that's on the other end of the line. And I do believe, or I feel in what you say, that indeed there's not a black and white thing. It's difficult stuff, and the best way to go about it is to agree that maybe there's a middle ground. Uh, and, and, and people who are entrusted with deciding what the middle ground is are the judges. All right, on that note, uh, thank you everyone for attending.